what's for. For the last nine weeks, Margaret Jenkins and her dancers have been creating and rehearsing their public dance performance, Danger Orange, which premieres tomorrow in Justin Herman Plaza in the heart of downtown San Francisco. It's a 40 minute piece. So, you know, the hope would be that the rain would kind of stall itself for 40 minutes and we would do it, but it is physically dangerous if it is more than a drizzle, so we wouldn't risk it and we'd wait for the next day. What would it be if it was along the front here and then where you would disappear would be along the other side? Yeah. The location is one of the only public spaces in San Francisco that's large enough to contain the seven stages of varying heights and sizes that were designed specifically for this performance. Today is the first time the dancers have been able to rehearse on the raised stages, and the rain has made the surfaces treacherous. Well, this was the day that we had hoped to really find out whether what we made in the studio would work here. Where I started really was wanting to make a piece that addressed the time that I think we are living in, and particularly the color orange metaphorically, you know, referencing the alert systems that are in place that we're all made to think are the measure of what's going on in the country and what we best be nervous about. It's much, much better here, so let's figure out the logistics. You see the danger of her walking? and she hangs over the side with her feet. It's great, looks fantastic here. Early on in her career, Margie, as she's known to her friends, danced and taught in New York with many of the pioneers of modern and postmodern dance, including Martha Graham, Twyla Tharp, and Merce Cunningham. You know, I'm kind of fond of saying I was in everybody's first company, you know, because the field is not very, very old. In 1970, she returned to San Francisco and soon after opened a dance studio and founded her own company. Her studio became the epicenter of dance experimentation on the West Coast. Margie, when she first arrived, set about uh, raising the standard of dancing in the city. Before she ever made work, she made dancers. She taught high energy classes and if you were any kind of a serious young modern dancer, you were in her class every day. And then still another, and an elderly man is walking his dog. In 2003, Margie celebrated the 30th anniversary of her company. Inside the 35,000 square foot Herbst Pavilion, 30 years of sets, sounds, costumes, and memories were installed. In the course of a week, the company performed dozens of pieces from Margaret Jenkins' repertoire. As a critic who had covered Margie's work uh, diligently, everything she did for, for the first decade or more of her work, I kind of held my breath at the 30th celebration, thinking that I'm going to feel old because the work's going to look old. And it was amazingly fresh. It, it was terrific. It was smart, it was edgy. Um, for me, it had all the freshness and even more than I remembered it having um, the nights of its premieres. I think the most impressive thing about her work is the way that she uses the stage uh, the way that she uses negative space in the stage and controls all of the stage space so it feels like a charged field. She's uh, really a master at these uh, spatial arrangements. It's both very difficult to do and it's also difficult to watch in the best sense of the term in that you have to be very present, a very active viewer, and she doesn't always tell you where to look and when to look. Um, it falls back on you what, what to attend to in the dance as it unfolds on the space. A hallmark of Margie's process is the extent to which she engages in creative collaboration. For each new piece, she works closely with her dancers to develop the choreography. Everyone is invited and expected to bring ideas to the table. Well, I think the reason that I collaborate 
uh, so rigorously is that at some point along the way, what I found was the physical language that I was developing had its limitations, and its limitations were me. Right. But for instance, the first action that you do, boom, let's say that's an element. You know, so if we say you have Margie's no longer performing as a dancer. For the last mm -hmm. several so the years, she's focused on right. producing new work for her company and mentoring young dancers yeah. like this Cara Davis, church. who will be traveling with her to China, where they will conduct a workshop like the ones she's previously held in Japan and India. It's really like a composition class or uh, a choreography class or experimenting with choreographic ideas, and Cara will be assisting me all along. She's the manifestation of my younger body. <laughs> well, one of the things that I hope that I'll learn is the kind of answer in this particular country, at least, as to how does gesture and meaning translate into the actual physical language. Do you know if you say speak um, and you want people to make movement that's about that, what does that mean? What does the word mean to someone in China? After three weeks of traveling throughout China, Margie and Kara arrive in Beijing, where they will continue teaching and developing new material with the Chinese Contemporary Dance Company. Margie, in many ways, has, has been as influential as a teacher as she has been as a choreographer. There's something about her work process that opens out a dancer's own capacity to make work. All right, great. Now everybody come back. So now I want um, each one of them mm -hmm. to make themselves um, a solo mm. from that material. Mm. They can choose three, four, or five elements mm -hmm. that they want to mm -hmm. work with mm -hmm. and make that into a 30-second Okay. Solos. So they're, they're kind of developing the source material. But I think the thing that really drives all of these, so to speak, cross-cultural things and certainly drove the China thing was not only what do I have to give, but what can I gather. You know, it's really how can who they are inform my process. Um, and what is it about who they are and how they've lived and how they dance that can really make me think differently about making my own works. All right, nice job, yes. It's performance day for Danger Orange, and after many days of rain, there's finally a break in the clouds. So are we all here? Before every performance, I feel nervous. You know, I, I, if you weren't nervous and or excited, somehow it would equal not caring. <laughs> Danger Orange is one of the most successful site-specific works I think I've ever seen. And it seems so simple. You know, it's just a huge orange stage in this vast space. But it plays with scale in some pretty incredible ways. And it uses that, that hulking, ominous fountain uh, there in the court so well. So I wanted to create little vignettes, little zones, uh, times when People were being very tender with each other and taking care of each other in times when, um, you know, there was the implied violence of someone being thrown around and um, all the unsafe territories that I think we live in and feel that we live in often. I thought the performance was a combination of the most amazing number of things. From the naked man with the football to the little girl. You know, to people wandering, to sirens, to fire engines, to clocks going off. I mean, it actually makes it all very poignant. When I am asked to look back on this kind of life that I had, I more often than not say, what did I do that I get to deserve having had these experiences? You know, I've traveled all over the world. I've worked with some of the most extraordinary human beings that exist in terms of their creative intelligence and their humanity. You know, it just 
has been remarkable, you know, absolutely remarkable. You know, I can't imagine doing anything else with my life.